Um, and, and also, and, and here's another thing. It's an anniversary this past week. If you just a few days ago, as we sit here, are you aware of the big anniversary? Uh, there are several. It's 40 years from 1984 and it's 30 years from 1994 and it's 20 years from 2004. There are lots of anniversaries. There are, there are no specifics contained therein. I don't know if I've, I haven't told this story in, in years. Maybe I have not told you this story, but in very brief, did I tell you the story of the one time over the last 20 years or whatever the f*** it was that I considered on a limited basis attempting to fly domestically? I can't imagine. I don't remember anything like that, and I think I would. Okay, well, you know, I've, I've gone to merry old England twice, heavily drugged and sedated and you know, oblivious to my surroundings, but I have not seriously entertained the thought of getting on an airplane to go anywhere in the United States for many, many years, right? But when I was in TNA, and I remember we've talked about the trip, Orlando to Louisville or my house to the impact zone, whichever way you want to phrase it, 862 miles. And at first, as, as I've mentioned I'd made the deal with Jeff Jarrett where, oh, well, I'll come down for the pay-per-view of the TV taping afterwards, maybe every, that one or every other one. It was going to be like eight times a year I was going to go, and that lasted about two months, and then he talked me into every fucking taping, every pay-per-view. So at one point, twice a month, I'm driving that 1,700-mile round trip, and finally there was... This was right toward the end of my tenure there in, in 2009. And there was a time where I, I would get so anxious to get home after two or three days or maybe even four days sometimes, those tapings and show went to two hours, etc. I would leave at six o'clock in the morning from the Double Tree over there at Universal and I had it timed where I could get through Atlanta before rush hour and I could skirt through Chattanooga and the time zone changed into Nashville and I could make the most of the traffic and I could be home in 14 hours. Eight o'clock that, that evening, 862 miles. It was a challenge, but it was doable. And goddamn this one trip, everything as I recall, there was construction and there was traffic schmazes, and there was the rain, probably inclement weather, and then it was January, so it was cold up here, even if it wasn't down there. And I remember the the drive as being particularly arduous and tedious and or nerve-wracking and or, my God, I want to get out of this fucking vehicle. And about the last hundred miles, Brian, I'd said, you know, you know what I'm saying to myself, I'm saying, maybe I just, I could take the Xanax, I could, you know, they, I'm trying to justify, figure out how this might logistically work, and I wouldn't dread it or hate myself or whatever. Get on a plane and do this every so often. I'm just getting too old for this shit, right? And I'd almost convinced myself that when I pulled into the garage here at Castle Cornet. And I opened the door to come in the house, and there's Harley Quinn wasn't there because she ain't that old, but there's Stace to greet me. And guess what's on the big screen TV in the TV room? Was it a plane crash? Captain Sully's plane floating down the fucking river. It was the end of 15 years ago, this past week. Yeah. And that is the first thing I saw, and I said, you know what? Never mind. There's a plane floating. It was a sign. If there is some kind of God, higher power, supreme being, alien that inseminated the planet Earth with its cast-offs, whatever, <laughs> that was a sign from them to me. Don't think that anymore. Listen to what you're saying. But he yourself. saved everyone. No, that that's a that's the miracle on the Hudson. It saved landed. everyone. He, Sully got everyone out. He did everything professionally. That's he the pilot landed, you want. He landed a fucking river. Yes, that's the pilot I want. If I have to have a pilot, but better off I don't have a pilot. And everybody, if I had been on that plane, everybody on that plane would have perished because they would have all <laughs> been smothered in shit. 
Can I read you something? Because it's so funny you bring this up. Someone just posted this the other day into the Cult of Cornet Facebook group. I'll give him credit. Nicholas Eduardo Lopez Torres. If, that is if, indeed... that, if those are indeed <laughs> all his real names. He posted this from the Gary Hart book. Uh, the actual title was My Life in Wrestling with a Little Help from My Friends by Gary Hart and Philip Varial. Notoriously out of print. Notoriously out of print. Notoriously inaccurate in some cases, or at least Gary Hart's worldview in some cases. But here's what it says. I always had a great deal of respect for Jim Cornette. Because even though he had a tremendous fear of flying... Oh, I remember this. He would get on an airplane to go to every show. I saw that kid fight his fear on a daily basis, and he white-knuckled every flight. One time, we were coming back from El Paso, <laughs> and we hit some real turbulence. It was terrible. We were bouncing around the sky, and Jim was literally freaking out. It got so bad that the plane landed in Lubbock so the pilots could check and see if anything had broken. <sighs> it was that bad. Jim, Bobby Eaton, and Dennis Condry got off the plane, rented a car, and drove to Dallas. Jim was scared to death of flying, and I always felt he was the bravest guy I ever knew. And and I pre I remember because obviously I have a copy of Gary's book and I appreciated that I remember reading that but I I got to tell the the straight thing is he has two stories conflated. Can I can I give details? Yeah, please. Because it, the the flight that he's talking about with the turbulence was from El Paso, and it was one of those Southwest flights and it was the it, they had a flight in. Uh, in Southwest Airlines in those days would have a flight from every one of the major Texas cities at like 11 o'clock or 1115. So whoever had done business or whatever that day could get on it and, and be back in Dallas. They, I mean, they didn't just go everywhere, but you could go to Dallas, right? So what we were El Paso, 600 miles from Dallas, Texas, even though it's in the same state. Or Lubbock and Amarillo were 300 and 350 miles, respectively. So Southwest at the time, like $39 or whatever, one way. And you could just walk up and buy the ticket. It is the, you know, cattle car of the air. So everybody would try to get the last flight to get back to Dallas after the show. And that's it's 11 o'clock, and so it's pitch fucking black outside. And we get up, and it's a Gary Hart, one-man gang, me. Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, the Fantastics, all the world-class guys are, we're not sitting because there's obviously regular people, although not too many of them on this flight. So we're not like sitting with the baby faces or whatever. We're still in the groups, but we're all on this fucking plane. Everybody's been on the show. And this thing starts bouncing up and down and you can see the, the wings and you can hear them creaking and you can see them moving in greater fucking space and frequency than the actual cabin of the plane is moving. Those wings are fucking flapping, right? And sideways. And I think of Tommy Rogers just, it, he was sitting with a bunch of girls in the back and he pulls out a joint and just starts smoking a joint. And everybody's holding on to shit. And I'd always... I laughed with Gary, and later on when we would be on Crockett's plane uh, during a period of time he was there, or whatever the case, I always joked that I liked flying with Flair because how many people you know been in two plane crashes, right? So right. I've got better odds. Gary had been in two plane crashes. Two? He had been in the in the famous one, and he had also gone down in a private plane, um, you know, years before that. So I was especially happy with him because I don't know how many people, you know, been in three plane crashes, right? But anyway, um, so that's the, but the, the renting the car was a different time. It was from Amarillo. We didn't land in Lubba. It was Amarillo to Dallas where we were trying to get out after a Lubbock Amarillo double shot. And the last we were there at the airport, cause it was only 10 minutes from the building, but this thunderstorm came up and the fucking lightning 
and all this bullshit. And I'm looking at it as they're about to, I say, you know what, folks, folks, I'll see y'all uh, at, in Fort Worth at the Will Rogers Coliseum tomorrow. And Bobby and Dennis got on the plane, but I went across the street to the La Quinta and got a room and rented the fucking car the next morning and drove back to, it took 300 miles from, you know, West Texas to Dallas, as flat as the road was, took about four, four and a half hours. And they said it was a miserable flight with miserable fucking weather. And it fucking poured rain on them when they got back at the airport trying to get in their car and the whole nine yards. And I just had a pizza at the fucking La Quinta and cruised on down the road the next day in a relaxed state. But I would do things like that. We, we were, if Crockett had run Cincinnati and we were on a loop that we had flown to the start of and the next day was Charleston, West Virginia, right? And we get the plane tickets and we've got to fly from Cincinnati to Louisville, which is 90 fucking miles, and then change planes and go to Charleston. And I'm like, well, what? All right, we're already on it, right? And the flight to Charleston would be another 45 minutes, but two takeoffs and two landings. That perturbed me somewhat. So we take off from Cincinnati. And I always keep a watch and an eye on these things. I know when we're supposed to be going up, when we're supposed to be going down, what the fucking noise is supposed to be going on. Is anything unusual? Do the flight attendants look nervous? These type of signals that you look for. And I see that we should have been descending about five minutes ago for this short of a flight. And the, the pilot comes on and says, ladies and gentlemen, there's weather in the, in the Louisville area. And uh, so we're going to circle for, and they circled for, I don't know, but it seemed like hours for me because now my asshole's so fucking tight. If you shoved a lump of coal up, you'd get a 10 carat diamond out. And they circled for 20 days. So we're going to go ahead and land now. And as they go ahead to land, they fly in these goddamn dark clouds. And suddenly, even though it's the middle of the day, everything, you can't see a goddamn thing. It's pitch black outside. And right as you think, well, I, we should see something eventually, a fucking clap of thunder and a bolt of lightning came right down next to the fucking wing. And at the same time, they gunned the engine and started going back up again. Oh, motherfucker. And they go back up, and now they're out of the clouds again, and then the pilot comes on and says, sorry, folks, we decided to take another run at that one. What? And they go back around, <laughs> and they fucking land again. They, they're going in to land again. And the same thing, only slightly lighter. They have found a different place in the clouds, and they go through the dark clouds, and I have literally sucked. My asshole has engorged every bit of the fucking fabric of the seat cushion underneath me into my fucking cavernous rectum. And I'm fucking putting the brakes on with both feet, and I've got a hold of both of the armrests. And they finally land here in my hometown, Louisville, Kentucky. Where as soon as we start taxiing, the guys are like, well, shit, we've got like 30 minutes to make this connection. I said, fuck you on your connection. I'm going to bid you people adieu, and I'll see you in Charleston. And they're, what? Said, it's 240 miles from this airport to Charleston, West Virginia. I'm going to get right off this fucking plane and rent a car, and I bet I beat you there at this rate. And I did, and I did. I beat some of them to the building in Charleston. But I wasn't going to go back up in the air that day. Fuck that. That was The lightning bolt was like, fuck you, get your ass on the ground. You see that story the other day about the door? Was it, was it a door? I guess it was it a door. Was a it just door, door window, the... side of the fucking wall, whatever. Yes. Yes. I was like, how did no one get sucked out of the plane? That's always my biggest fear. Something like that happened. Everyone goes flying out of the plane. Well, no, I know why. Do you know why? I mean, they stabilized the pressure, right? No, I'll tell you why. They were at 16,000 feet. If they'd have been a cruising at an altitude of 35,000 feet, some people would have been plummeting downward at a, at a fucking velocity of 120 miles an hour. 
And the fucking thing just falls off. It just falls off. They just fell off. Where, where'd Maud go? She was sitting here a minute ago. Well, the hell, the seat's gone too. Maud? Maud? Well, we'll see if uh, we can maybe do our vacation across the country via train. Yeah, Am Amtramic. That's what we need to get on the Amtramic and do it. We'll do it like the old barnstorming days, the ballyhoo days. We'll do it from the back of the train car. All a bit, and and we'll send telegrams to the next fucking town with coded words for who the finish is. You know how upset you would be if you died in a plane crash because of TNA? Oh, and, and that's the thing, of all things. <laughs> yeah, well, what was I thinking? See, some people, you know, once in a while you go mad. You, you're just thinking crazy things, and then you get a sign. 